Hello and good afternoon. We will wait for a couple of seconds more until everyone has entered. Um, has entered the Zoom room and we will also manage to uh, connect with the Facebook stream since this needs a couple of seconds more. Please don't disconnect. We will be back in a second and start officially when the Facebook stream is also connected and online. And until then, I can already remind some of you that we have Russian and English interpretation. Um, you will find the interpretation on your screen behind the globe and you can switch on either to Russian or to English. So we will explain this later in the chat for everyone who might arrive a bit later. Just a few seconds more until we start then. Nico, can you give me a sign when we are online with the Facebook stream? Facebook is online. Okay, then Heidi, you take over. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Viola. Uh, so welcome to all of you uh, to this um, uh, webinar where we look what could be the role to peace in Nagorno-Karabakh and what the role of the EU could be. As we know that uh, the 26 years of regular meetings of the OSC Minsk Group and its co-chairmanship has not really led to any sustainable solution. And um, after the, the uh, ceasefire agreement was broken uh, by, by Russia between Armenia and Azerbaijan on the 10th of November 2020, the situation remains very unstable and um, we could now discuss uh, how indeed the international community and in particular uh, the uh, EU could contribute to a lasting peace. And it seems to me very obvious that um, one of the conditions is that the both sides must uh, stop uh, spreading um, instrumental misunderstanding, inflammatory statements and racial and religious hatred. And we're very pleased to have in this uh, seminar or webinar uh, speakers from the region who are known to be able to talk to each other from across the, the lines. And we're also very much um, happy to see uh, the uh, European Action, uh, External Action Service and the European Commission uh, represented and, and the special representative. Uh, so um, I hope we will have fruitful discussions and some ideas on, on the road further to peace in Nagorno-Karabakh. And um, I would just like to give you a couple of um, household remarks, um, which are basically that um, we have a bilingual webinar. Uh, the two languages are to be found uh, in uh, the Zoom, but only in the Zoom. So if you are on Facebook, you can join the Zoom uh, to have the interpretation. Uh, so um, we will have a full um, uh, Russian English interpretation. And uh, we will also use the, the Q&A section of the Zoom for, for, for your comments and uh, questions to the speakers. And, and so we hope to have a, a lively exchange. Uh, but I would want to hand, hand over to, to um, uh, Nikolos to explain in Russian uh, how the interpretation would be accessible. And then after, right after that, I'm very happy to, to ask my co-chair uh, and colleague Viola von Kramon to, to take over to introduce the first panel and continue. So. Дорогие русскоговорящие зрители, спасибо за участие в нашем вебинаре. Перевод предоставляется на английский и русский языки. Пожалуйста, на вашем экране в зуме нажмите на иконку перевод, которая выглядит как глобус, чтобы выбрать английский или русский язык. Спасибо. Thank you very much, uh, Heidi, uh, especially for taking the initiative of this very, very important um, topic. Uh, we have been all suffering uh, during the last weeks, months, and uh, we have been not able um, 
to travel to the region. Uh, but we have also seen quite an absence, not just of us, European parliamentarians, but also of the European institution as such. And we thought this might be a good opportunity to try to at least come into contact uh, in this digital mode and um, listen to what people from the region have to say and how as a European Union, how as parliamentarians, we might be more active, more visible, and also, um, I mean, play an active, uh, constructive role, which maybe we have missed uh, for the last weeks and months, also due to Corona, of course. I would like to mention that we have negotiated a very strong and very good uh, urgency a resolution, uh, which will be voted on uh, tomorrow, and also uh, we will have a plenary debate on this. Uh, for the return of uh, political prisoners. Uh, but in the end, of course, it is not just about the political prisoners. It's about more on reconciliation and what we should do and where is also uh, the uh, responsibility of both of the authorities. And I hope we can discuss this more in detail. For the first panel, we welcome very much four very well-known and also distinguished guests and speakers from almost all over the world, I can say. First of all, uh, we welcome Larissa uh, Minizian. Uh, she was uh, the former executive director for uh, the Open Society Foundation in Armenia, and uh, she joins us today from the U.S. Thanks a lot, Larissa, for taking our invitation. The second speaker today will be Ramazan uh, Zamadov, also a guest, uh, very well known by some of the uh, viewers today. He is uh, currently the Secretary General of the Association of Young Azerbaijanian Professionals in Europe. And since he has a lot of experience also with the European Parliament and with others, uh, we are very glad that you are one of our voices from Azerbaijan today. Uh, amongst us, uh, also well-known and a big expert in the region is uh, Luc de Vigne uh, from the uh, European External Action Service. He is currently the Deputy Managing Director for Russia, Eastern Partnership, Central Asia, and the Regional Cooperation um, and the OSCE. And I hope he can maybe elaborate a little bit why we have been absent, at least uh, from our perspective, a little bit too much, and we left so much room for Russia and Turkey and others. And last but not least, we're very glad also to welcome Lawrence uh, Meredith. Uh, he's the director of the uh, EU's Eastern Neighborhood Institution Building, so the DG near um, at the European Commission. But first of all, I would like to give uh, the speakers from the region, Larissa and Ramadan, the floor first. Please, Larissa, um, you take over. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Excellencies, members of the European Parliament, dear colleagues. Before I start, I want to uh, make this statement that indeed I am the former director of uh, the Open Society Foundations. Uh, currently, I'm not. And everything I say uh, is my personal position of an independent um, analyst rather than uh, and, and doesn't, uh, doesn't relate to the Open Society Foundations. Um, I'm honored and pleased to be uh, part of this discussion, which I consider indeed very important because understanding uh, the, the situation and um, the scenarios for peace are, are necessary, but I think uh, um, the analysis are, um, uh, the, the actions are overdue. Analysis, uh, analysis have been done for long and we see that the actions are needed at the moment. It is uh, said and has been proven uh, repeatedly, you want justice, you invest you want peace, you invest in justice. Um, one can extrapolate that um, uh, peace as attainable as there is accountable um, and uh, fair process of access to justice established. Uh, from that perspective, uh, we are not in a good situation. Uh, justice has been violated 
and uh, uh, has been violated at all levels, so international justice, including humanitarian, uh, international humanitarian law uh, have been violated uh, repeatedly. Um, and uh, no uh, measures uh, have been established uh, to start the access to justice and hence um, the peace process. One can argue that uh, there are very few if any instruments to prevent uh, the violations and aggressions. But uh, fortunately, there are working instruments, effective in instruments of international law to uh, reactive instruments of international law uh, as investigation um, into the violations, assessment of the aggression, qualification of the aggression, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, path to execution of justice. None have been, none, have, none has been uh, employed uh, yet despite the very volatile situation that the welcome ceasefire of uh, November 10 established. The situation uh, remained volatile exactly because of the type of an agreement and uh, the uh, setting of the agreement that was signed. Uh, this indeed was a very welcome step, the establishment of the ceasefire. But uh, since November 10, right after that, civil society and many international analysts pointed out at uh, the uh, volatility and, uh, and risks of that agreement. And the volatility and risks of that agreement are set in the unaccountability of that agreement and uh, lack of uh, lack of guarantees, security and rights guarantees for the people of uh, living there, for the people of Nagorno-Karabakh. The civil society and the experts urged the return of the international community, which has been pointed, been lacking since um, uh, that process, return of the process into the format that was sanctioned by the uh, UN, effective or not, but worked for uh, so long years, and most primarily, it has all the legitimacy and instruments of the international uh, uh, international uh, rule of law. And um, what has been happening since November ten, uh, the multiple violations show exactly how unimplementable and um, literally broken that agreement was. Um, we have been, we have seen multiple violations of, uh, of the, of the uh, situation um, uh, left under the patronage of only uh, one country, uh, or which is notoriously uh, meaning to get control of the entire South Caucasus region and thus cut and isolate the entire region from the international law and justice system. Um, the un unenforceable, unenforceability of that uh, agreement is either in the lack of the provisions that are there or in that unaccountability of that agreement to international law both make it unenforceable and leaving the situation as was since November 10 brought to the fact that uh, until now we see the prisoners of war and civilians being detained and not being possible to return despite uh, calls coming from the highest offices uh, in the world. Um, we unfortunately have seen how unenforceable this agreement and the peacekeeping is uh, on May 12, when uh, the sovereign country member of OSC was invaded. Uh, and uh, because on May 12, Azerbaijani forces invaded uh, Armenia proper. And um, despite the calls, uh, there is no uh, sign of withdrawal. Uh, this discussion was planned, and I was invited before uh, this happened. 
Um, and I had a very different set and very different take on the situation because uh, as horrible as the war was and as horrible the violations were and as inexcusable breaking of the uh, cold conflict into hot uh, uh, were, any conflict, any war present an opportunity for, uh, for settlement uh, for a longer peace rather than stalemate that was uh, during the decades. Unfortunately, the continuous provocation and now very blatant violations, even of the, not even of the international law, but of the provisions of that article, make it really impossible to speak of the peace before the process is brought into, into international justice. Any steps should start only after unconditional withdrawal of the forces, uh, return to the situation that the agreement provided, which is when, uh, where they were before, uh, right at the moment uh, of the ceasefire, and unconditional return of the prisoners of war and civilians. Only after that, uh, the measures that uh, are needed, which in um, uh, our understanding is establishing the process of uh, uh, justice, bringing the uh, process into accountable internationally uh, notarized path of the Minsk group negotiations, where all the provisions of the Minsk group that have been on the table for so long, namely international peacekeepers, the, the issue of the status of Nagorno-Karabakh, um, exclusion of aggression as a means to uh, the resolution of the conflict shall be employed and shall be on the table. However, uh, I have to say that these are only the measures that can work uh, only after uh, the two unconditional shall be, uh, shall be preserved. What shall follow is monitoring of the ceasefire and, uh, and, and enforcement of the ceasefire in the all capacity of the uh, of the international uh, instruments that are there, and there are, are international instruments. When I said that action is needed, action is needed because we see that first the agreement is unenforceable, either because it is unaccountable or lacks the provisions, but most likely because of the both uh, and um, and the absence of international scrutiny over it um, and international mechanisms to implement that. And the European Union has all these instruments. Uh, these are uh, primarily investigation and assessment of the, uh, of the violations. And as we see, since all the calls have been, uh, which are very welcome, but have been uh, impossible to uh, urge the country to um, uh, abide by international law and let the prisoners go, uh, it is time for action, it is time for sanctions. It is argued that sanctions punish people and not the countries. This is, uh, in my opinion, very hypocritical argument because regimes fold to sanctions. Regimes, uh, 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 regimes have to, uh, have to uh, abide uh, by international law, not only because this is a humanitarian thing and there is um, literally uh, trade in people going on, but because of the rise of authoritarian tendencies that make uh, this um, might is right uh, approach and democracy is inherently uh, weaker than strong hand and authoritarian regime uh, and military escalation, these tendencies and these narratives, if we give in, uh, set a very dangerous example in our explosive and again, the world where authoritarian tendencies are on the rise. Um, the South Caucasus are uh, the territory of Europe and um, and uh, and uh, a member of the international community and uh, um, OSC uh, in all the countries that are there and guaranteeing that uh, peace and security of uh, the people, rights of the people is beyond one country's will. Whether Armenia applies, the authorities of, of the country apply for the intervention of the international community or not, this should be international law and mechanisms should be employed because 
it is the UN, it is the international community that guarantees uh, the, um, uh, the peace and the security of these people and the rights of these people. So uh, with that, I urge uh, the action rather than uh, continuous um, discussions. Uh, although I have to say that uh, it is indeed uh, very important uh, for these things to happen and for your presence, European Union presence, and bringing the process under the European and world uh, scrutiny is absolutely paramount for the peace. Um, I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you for the very clear words and also the appeal to take um, to take an active role and to take over from the European side. <clears throat> Later on, we will hear from our European or EU representatives how this could work and uh, maybe what is already on the way, um, uh, that this uh, would be a more inclusive uh, path <clears throat> than in the past. Right now, I would like to hand over to Ramazan and maybe you could also react um, on some of these, I think very um, obvious um, cases, what uh, Larissa has said, this continuous provocation, uh, the May uh, 12th uh, territory encroachment and things like this. So um, even if you have not prepared everything, maybe you could uh, react on, on, on some of, uh, of the examples which were given by Larissa. Please, you have the floor, Ramazan. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Viola, for inviting me here to speak and be part of such a panel. Uh, I'll, I'll, I would like to briefly go back in the history in order to speak about the future. Uh, Azerbaijan became independent for the second time when I was seven years old. So we had 5% uh, inflation, not per year, but per day. My father lost his job and I had to fish together with him in order to feed my family during the entire summer of 1991. Later, we had a full-scale war with Armenia and everyone knows what happened after. And a bit later, I turned uh, 16 years old uh, when uh, Azerbaijan became a member of the Council of Europe. I was a student then and I believed in Europe. And I still believe in it uh, since uh, overall I've spent 10 years of my life uh, as a full-time job in Brussels on U.S.-Azerbaijan relations. Heidi, Paolo and other friends uh, know it very well. After all, European border is defined through acceptance of ideas and principles uh, rather than through geography or ethnicity. Today I'm 37 and uh, under current conditions, the European idea in my country is much weaker than it was 20 years ago. Indeed, partially this is due to Karabakh conflict. I should be very clear, Azerbaijanis today have serious uh, grievances toward uh, some, some European policy actors. And I'm not talking about the government, human rights record or any other topics which are being raised every time when similar discussion, discussions take place. In the eyes of Azerbaijanis, Europe is less and less uh, honest broker. The image of honest Europe tarnished uh, with one-sided and partial declarations uh, and also initiatives uh, by many European, especially French political forces during and after the war. I'm afraid that good governance initiatives coming from the European organizations will not have the same popularity as they used to have. And it's because there is a growing distrust to European actors uh, who are accused of hypocrisy and double standards. Dear Viola, uh, you are a smart and fair person as all we know, and you are a really true friend of our region, Armenia, Georgia, and Azerbaijan. No one has a doubt on it, but even you, who knows the region very well, made a political statement just a couple of days ago on recent border conflict between Azerbaijan and Armenia, which is a very complex issue. This issue has been raised also by my Armenian colleague Larissa uh, just before me. Uh, and probably you did also raise it uh, because you received lots of email and calls uh, from, from Armenian community. 
in the conflict, there are always at least two sides, and you need to listen to both sides, to be fair. According to Azerbaijan, this territory was uh, is, is part of Lachin district of Azerbaijan, which was under Armenian occupation for three decades. For Azerbaijanis who hardly heard any Western politicians condemning Armenian military occupation, these kind of declarations are quite shocking. It's worrisome when uh, politicians reproduce false information without checking it. Indeed, it's, it's also a reflection of uh, miscommunication and what part of miscommunication is whose fault is a matter of separate dis discussion and probably we need one panel about it too. We saw it uh, during the active phase of the conflict as well. We, we see it also now, we have seen it before, like uh, Christians again, Muslims, Democrats again, autocrats, all sorts of uh, misleading stereotypes uh, which blurred the actual picture. In short, we need to clean up the system and messages on all sides. Now to the peace process. Trilateral agreement is being implemented. Uh, as, as also Larissa mentioned, uh, some parts of it move, fast, move faster, some, some, some slower, but all in all, there is a progress and uh, it's quite dynamic. Most of the territories from where Azerbaijanis were ethnically cleansed are back. However, we should remember that uh, refugee issue is still far from being sorted. Yes, territories are back under Azerbaijan's sovereign control, but people cannot go back simply because there are no homes to go back to. Cities and villages are simply destroyed. Another reason why people cannot go back to their homes are uh, minefields. Hundreds of thousands of unmapped minefields, minefields uh, are already everywhere and, and took 20 lives of civilians uh, in the post-war stage and it still remains as a physical obstacle uh, for return of, uh, of, of IDPs. In fact, Azerbaijan refugees uh, still remain the major refugee pro problem in the territory of OECE and Council of Europe, but nobody really cares. If Europe wants to be heard in Azerbaijan, I can give you the receipt. Start with admitting the past failure to fix Karabakh problem and offer a reasonable and sincere help in all issues, not only in the subjects uh, uh, that are being actively promoted by one or another side. If Europe consolidates this position and does it, Azerbaijan will listen. And again, I'm not talking about the government of Azerbaijan, I'm just talking about people. Is peace sustainable? Yes, but it will come uh, with economic cooperation and regional open up, be it communications, trade or travel. Long-term peace will start when people will start to interact on a daily basis. Is it possible? Absolutely. Of course, I can speak only for Azerbaijan, but I guess and hope uh, similar sentiments exist on Armenian side as well. We want to leave this conflict behind us. We in Azerbaijan look forward to peaceful Karabakh where Armenians safely live in this beautiful ancient place uh, where geography is so mosaic and, and uh, all, all Armenian villages, uh, neighboring uh, Azerbaijani villages, where all towns uh, had people living in the same neighborhoods without any ethnic or religion uh, divisions. South Caucasus is one of the most diverse places, as, as you know, uh, and uh, there are obvious historical and geographical reasons for it. We should restore it and it's possible to do it. Our European friends and partners should understand this dynamic and contribute to it through being well-informed, fair and engaging. Don't, don't play revanchist card. Don't fall into crusading rhetoric trap. Focus on cultural dialogue, reintegration, trade and coexistence. 
Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Ramazan, for this uh, very honest um, and uh, very clear also statement from your side. Uh, before we start uh, the debate, we have two more speakers, but nevertheless, I would invite and um, ask everyone who has questions to put them in the Q&A. I've seen a, um, a raised hand. We can also make possible that we open microphones. So in the case of Emin Hussainov, uh, I'm happy to give you the floor after we have finished our first round of speakers here. Please, Luke, you would be the next one for giving us some ideas from the European side, please. And thank you very much, uh, honorable member, and thanks to you and Vice President Hautala uh, for this kind invitation. And also, I'm happy to greet also the other honorable members of the European Parliament who have seen are amongst the, the participants of this debate. Uh, thanks also to these two previous speakers for the interesting presentation. And I think that uh, one thing is clear from this presentation is that this conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan has very old and deep roots. And uh, it's fueled, unfortunately, by memories of atrocities suffered by both sides, a sense of injustice of a lost land, which is shared by many components of both societies. Uh, and it complicates, obviously, the achievement of a sustainable uh, settlement uh, to the conflict. And um, indeed, uh, we, we now have a, a ceasefire agreement brokered by Russia uh, after the 44 days uh, of war. Um, but um, uh, the, unfortunately, there is no peace. There is, there is an absence of war, but the conflict is not over. Um, and for the conf a conflict being over means to have normal diplomatic relations, to have borders open, to have possibility for people to travel to settle where they wish. None of this is, 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 is existing. Uh, the European Union uh, supports territorial integrity of Azerbaijan and of all its, uh, of all states actually, and particularly all the states in Eastern Partnership. Um, who have uh, for many, unfortunately, uh, a territorial integrity uh, being disputed. Um, but fundamentally, um, the Minsk Group, which has it indeed, as, as uh, Heidi Hodala was referring, uh, has not achieved a sustainable peace, and the 44 days war is the evidence of that, if needed be. And um, and therefore, the question of the status remains an issue. Uh, it is unimaginable uh, to, to imagine that there would be peace without proper minority rights, etc. And um, the road to peace, as this, this seminar is, is, is entitled, is indeed um, uh, requires that some of these core problems are, are being addressed. And let me just highlight a few issues that we see both on the short term first and, and the long term after. On the short term, indeed, and it's been mentioned, um, we think that the toning down of offensive or inflammatory rhetoric or actions is extremely important. Um, issues like border demarcation, and last week, uh, the Secretary General of the External Action Service spoke to both Armenian and Azerbaijani ministers on this on these matters. Also, uh, demonstrates the recent tensions that uh, a methodology needs to be agreed and uh, and, and parties need to stick to it. Um, the mining it was mentioned. Indeed, releasing any information available to effective demining of the conflict region is a must, and the EU is very much ready to help in this regard. And um, I'm sure Lawrence, the next speaker, will, will, will touch upon what we are ready to do uh, in this regard. Uh, but uh, releasing uh, detainees um, and even uh, dealing with uh, human remains, including sometimes from the first Nagorno-Karabakh wars in the 90s, also are, are important uh, to do. On the longer term, uh, Indeed, and the EU certainly has an experience in this. We 
should support occasions for people to people contact we have programs in this regard you for peace you for dialogue and uh, Lawrence again may, may say a word in this the contribution contributing to the protection and or the restoration of cultural religious heritage sites is important um, supporting initiatives for which both populations would benefit i'm thinking of the uh, water uh, management uh, which is very much a cross-border issue uh, and eventually supporting transport economic interconnectivity um, but for that uh, there also needs to be political will and if, if we take the analogy of the eu which we all know was created through a common production of steel and coal uh, in, in in 52 um, we cannot compare the situation between, say, France and Germany, where the, um, who had who had suffered two wars and actually uh, two world wars and, and even one bilateral war in 1870, with the situation today. And whereas um, economic integration uh, is very much uh, important, and it was the method to uh, to, to create the EU, there was also a need to develop diplomacy. There were, there, were, there were diplomatic relations between the EU, within the EU, between France and Germany and the other founding members, et cetera. We, we cannot compare the situation. So I think it's important to solve this. Let me just um, finish by, by this introduction by, by saying that uh, what is needed is to restore a minimum confidence between both sides. And the EU, is willing to play a role. You know that in the past, the EU per se has been limited because the only internationally agreed format was the OSC means group uh, 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 co-chairs where uh, EU had one member state, but what's not the EU, it actually predates even the EU common foreign security policy. Um, and nevertheless, uh, the EU has a number of assets it can share. Uh, first of all, uh, both countries are in Eastern partnership and both have positive relations uh, with, with the EU. Armenia has recently um, an agreement entered into force. Uh, Azerbaijan has fairly advanced negotiations. Um, and I think it would be fair to say that the US kept a neutral stance in the conflict, often criticized by both parties but it's probably uh, the evidence that the EU is neutral. I would say a second advantage is that uh, peace is, of course, in EU DNA. Uh, thirdly, EU has no colonial past and obviously no colonial future in the region, which is not necessarily the case of all uh, the neighbors. Uh, and it has no hidden agenda. Uh, it has a positive agenda in terms of economic development, but also of, of people to people contact, etc. So, um, I think EU and the High Representative is very much ready to engage uh, either himself or uh, with the help of, of EU foreign ministers um, to, to play a role, but it takes two to tango and uh, uh, the parties need to be willing uh, to entrust the EU with a role, uh, with such a role, uh, taking into account obviously other regional actors and we have seen that um, there was a trend also to sometimes exclude the EU from uh, peace uh, agreements and to, to astonize the process, as it, as it, to, to use an, a, a, um, a comparison. But it's very much for the, for the parties to, to decide now. We all know that in 20th century, there were two world wars, uh, and there were two very types of end to these world wars. Uh, the end of the first world war was Versailles Treaty and its satellite treaties, and it led to what we know. And uh, by contrast, in 1945, the thing was completely, the, the attitude was completely different and it led to the creation of the, the coal, coal community and steel community and, and later on the EU. And so the question is, uh, and I hope uh, that the answer is that we are now more in a situation like 1945 than 1980. Thank you. Sorry, my technical difficulties to unmute myself. Thanks a lot. I'm tempted to start already with asking you some more questions, but I would like to listen first to Lawrence. Um, and also maybe you can react to, to some of that, what was said uh, or, or the remarks also from uh, Larissa's side, so no sanctions and so this hypocritical 
uh, uh, topic was mentioned many times by both of our guests uh, from the region. So maybe you could also pick up on this a bit, Lawrence, please. You have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Viola, Honourable Member, uh, Honourable Vice President. Such a, a pleasure to be with you uh, this afternoon. It's an extremely uh, important subject and an extremely timely debate, in our view. And um, uh, in fact, uh, as, as you may know, uh, there have been a, a series of discussions uh, in the past weeks in the Council uh, looking at, uh, across the region at the unresolved conflicts because uh, I'd like to be very clear, the European Union, from the very outset of neighbourhood policy, uh, committed to step up our engagement in this area. Um, we won't hide from the difficulties in the very early days, in the early 2000s. Um, that was um, not so easy. Um, but now, as we're well advanced in the development of the common foreign and security policy, and uh, also in our cooperation with NATO, uh, I would also say that we've um, really stepped up our engagement. Um, of course, in support of the um, internationally recognized formats, as, um, as uh, Luke has just said. Uh, but I think it's very clear um, that we consider that it's um, the, those populations affected by the conflict need support. That's fundamental. It's not acceptable that on the European continent there are people who don't have uh, access to basic social services, education, health. Um, uh, there are many other issues that have been mentioned by the, all the previous speakers. And I mean, on, uh, uh, as regards what my team does, uh, we, we want to step into that um, gap. Uh, we really want to help. Um, the crucial issue here is access. It is, uh, at the moment, it's only the International Committee of the Red Cross who have access. And um, that makes it extremely difficult for us to provide the kind of support that we would want to supply. Uh, and even where one or other side uh, could accept there to be access, it's not done in a way where there can be some agreement on how it can be done uh, in, a, let's say, in a conflict neutral manner. That's absolutely the first step for us to reach out to these conflict affected populations. And I know Commissioner Vahe has um, been discussing this with the foreign ministers, both of Armenia and Azerbaijan. And um, we really want to find a way forward on this. We have already put forward and are delivering on 7 million euros of primarily humanitarian funding. As you will have heard, Commissioner Vahe also announced an additional 10 million um, that will uh, be further humanitarian, but also work towards more comprehensive conflict transformation and longer term socioeconomic development, which I think has uh, come out from a lot of what um, the, the, the other speakers have said. And I mean, you know, to build on some of the remarks that Luke has made, you know, let's, let's go back uh, four years to the last summit where we'd worked hard to change the language uh, previously, we talked of protracted conflicts, which is certainly true. Uh, now we talk of unresolved conflicts. And I think that sends a strong signal that the European Union wants to be part of the solution. We believe that there needs to be a long-term solution that is sustainable, that offers a sustainable peace to all the peoples uh, affected by this uh, awful conflict. Of course, we saw a tragic resumption of hostilities last autumn. Um, now it's really important as uh, that we, we help contribute to rebuild trust. Of course, it's, it's badly damaged, that's evident. Uh, but I mean, as Lucas very eloquently said, the European Union was born out of conflict itself. We want to be and have experience in other parts of the world in contributing to that, in uh, working with the Minsk Group co-chairs, working with the OSCE, of course, um, and, and naturally with this house, with the European Parliament, who we, we play a fundamental role uh, in, in, in this process. So um, I think, you know, we, we are extremely committed to this. We had designed a project called the EU for Dialogue, which I've spoken in this house before, 15 million euro program, designed very flexibly because one of the challenges in, in, in moving beyond conflict is you're never quite sure what, um, how support can best be provided or where there will be an opportunity to help, can be on education, can be on health, can be on some basic infrastructure, can be on people to people contact. So we've designed it flexibly. We've even put the different conflicts of the region 
uh, as potential scope because sometimes there's a possibility to move forward in one of the conflicts where there might not be on the other. Uh, so this is the most flexibly designed program. It's a very substantial program, but it also requires engagement and acceptance from the from all parties because to to be effective in providing uh, response uh, in the aftermath of, of conflict, you need to get all parties on board. And that I think is the urgent priority now to find a framework uh, that will allow much, much needed support to come in. And I must uh, stress again, this issue of access uh, and, and to really work together uh, for the common humanitarian good uh, and to start the process, the long and difficult process of rebuilding trust and confidence and, uh, and working with people who are brave enough to come forward and to uh, in, in, in sometimes very challenging environments to speak in favor of rebuilding that trust. And I think that's that's fundamental. And I think that's also where this house can play a very important role. So um, pleased to be part of the debate and looking forward to the questions and answers. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lawrence, for your precise and nevertheless very comprehensive overview of the activities uh, preceded in your uh, DG and your DG near. We will come back to that a bit later. I would like to open the microphone for Emino Seno first and then to our colleague Andreas Kubilius. I ask you both to be short, precise and raise questions. No co-commentaries, please. Emin, you have the floor. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh... So, hi, my name is Emin Hussainov. Uh, and uh, thanks for, for, for organizing this very important event. Yeah, I think it's a clear example for still European institution uh, reacted on this important issues very late, but thanks again. It's better to organize late or than never. Well, so I'm representative of civil society in Azerbaijan. I'm living in exile still, and many my colleagues still working in Azerbaijan under big pressure. My question is, uh, is to officials, for representative of uh, executive institutions, and also to European Parliament representatives. For what do you think? Uh, because Larissa said uh, very important things was it's peace, sustainable peace need sustainable investment. And I think my personal opinion is for European Union lose momentum and European institutions and even European private, like say donors, they never invest enough for uh, peace in region. Even after this bloody war, which is in 44 days from both sides, it's approximately died uh, more than 7,500 people and 20,000 injured soldiers still until today staying in the very difficult conditions and nobody helped them. We didn't see for anyone like invest on this again. And why it's not happened? Because I know for European Union always says for it's impossible to in, support civil society in Azerbaijan because it's restrictive law. But it's, I think it's like a not fair response because if you want, we will see how you work in Belarus. Uh, you always find like a backdoor mechanism to support. Uh, but today in Azerbaijan and Armenia, I think civil society needs serious support from institutions like EU. If and we don't need to wait a re a reaction from our authorities because our authorities still uh they don't care about people's voice and i'm not agree with the ramazan which is say for uh, european union <laughs> need to uh, apologize in front of uh, uh, azerbaijani people because azerbaijani people not uh, trust anymore to european union values it's not true i think it's uh azerbaijani people hundreds of people thousands of people every month call me and ask me for this. We want to just escape from this country because no justice, no hope in this country. It's countries which has received 160 billion oil incomes 
staying in the poverty. And this is only capital, Baku with the uh, big business centers. It's not clear explanation what we have in reality in our, our social economic life. And that's what my question. When European Union really, really start to talking with civil society in Armenia and in Azerbaijan to moving forward and start to organize dialogues. Between, okay, I mean, uh, I mean, it was people. a very long question. I, I fully share your point. You. I think it is it is well noted. Thanks a lot. Andreas Kubilius would be the next one. And I would also give the floor then to Laila Yunus, who is very well known here in this in this round. Uh, Andreas Kubilius, please go ahead. If you can speak and the microphone is open. I hope so. If you can hear me. I will try to be very brief on, on three points, three questions. One is really, you know, we need to see what had happened in the second war as a consequence, of course, of the first war. Uh, after the first war, Armenians were trying to keep status quo, uh, but uh, then they lost second war. Now Azerbaijanians are trying to keep status quo. And the question is really on the much longer term future. What is what is next? My question is, uh, first question is to, um, on one side to Armenians, on another side to Azerbaijanis. Are you trying really, and how to, how we can help, you know, to encourage you to look much more deeply, you know, into what, what can be called, you know, exercise of soul searching. Uh, is, is really, uh, because without, without uh, your nations, your societies, you know, uh, uh, going into deep soul searching, you know, exercise and understanding what are the major, you know, issues and challenges and why those wars are going on. I think that, you know, things will not change in the region uh, so, so positively as we would like to see. And I'm always, you know, uh, offering to read uh, recent, not so recent, several years ago, published Jared Diamond book, Upheaval, how nations cope with crisis and, and change. Uh, there are a lot of experiences in different countries how after some kind of national crisis, they managed to go into this you know, soul searching and, and managed to find a different way uh, looking into the future. Second question to uh, Luke and, and Lawrence, you know. Uh, here were interesting experiences uh, uh, recently uh, done by US administration. Uh, of course, the previous one, uh, uh, Trump administration, the so-called Abraham agreements, when they were attempting to, you know, with a huge offer of uh, uh, financial and economical investment, you know, to push uh, both several Arab countries and Israel uh, to find a peace agreement. And they, in some ways, they succeeded. Can we imagine that EU will come out with some kind of, you know, I would not call Abraham agreement, maybe, you know, with some different uh, uh, title, but uh, of similar approach to what's Azerbaijan and Armenia, offering them really big investment in uh, with very clear condition if they will manage to agree among themselves on long-term peace and stability in the region. And the last question, perhaps, perhaps to you, to you. We just recently discussed with Georgia and friends you know, on Monet dialogue. Uh, which is good, uh, you know, instrument uh, to assist uh, countries, you know, which have internal political problems. But can we imagine that, you know, European Parliament would be able to introduce, for example, some kind of new format, which I would call, I don't know, Schumann dialogue, you know, to offer, uh, you know, dialogue in between of two parliaments uh, of two nations, which are still not able to come down to some kind of more peaceful dialogue. I would be very, very happy to see some kind of this initiative. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Andreas. I'm not so sure whether we can uh, cover this within the next 20 minutes, but nevertheless, uh, we will try. Thanks a lot for the comments. Laila, would you be ready to speak and be precise? And so we can have a second round on the panel here and uh, try to get all the questions and even maybe some more. Yes. Response. Do, do you hear me? Yes, we hear you very well. Okay, thank you. So I have a question and suggestion. How the Second Karabakh War start? And who in reality win in this war? Vladimir Putin, when Pashinyan tried to be independent and more close to West and not working under Putin as it did Kocharyan, Putin was 
agree. And Putin also did not like that in Azerbaijan there are no Russian troops which uh, left Azerbaijan by the demand of the um, Azerbaijan government in 1992-1993. Uh, so as a result of the Second War, Pashinyan now is understand that first of all, Putin and big uh, army, Russian army, stay on the territory of Azerbaijan. So Putin, it is the first winner. Then, uh, can we think about the new war? Yes, and it will be. I'm sure that it will be new war. Why? Because for peace, it's necessary that Azerbaijan population and Armenian population want peace, do not want war. But what in reality doing Ilham Aliyev in Azerbaijan. He did not spoke that, come on, let's think about peace with Armenia. He organized so-called Park of Victory with these horrible figures of Ar Armenian soldiers. The, uh, in Russian, it's Armenophobia, this uh, uh, propaganda against Armenia, it's continuing in Azerbaijan. After the first Karabakh war, Armenians activists of civil society and Azerbaijans, we tried to create a communication, public diplomacy, uh, our Institute for Peace and Democracy and Armenians in Joe region created first and single common website, Armenia Azerbaijan. Uh, public dialogue was the name of this website. And we try to organize a dialogue not only between different historians, human rights defenses, but first of all, between new generation. Because if our generation growing um, with Armenians as a brother, sisters, very good friends, the new generation growing uh, where the mind is that Armenians is enemy. And what did Ilham Ali? He prohibited to visit Armenians, activists of civil society in Azerbaijan. And from 2004, we can visit Yerevan, but Armenians cannot visit Baku, and it's still working. So, still, there are no uh, possibilities for uh, peaceful uh, negotiation. We cannot think about peace. This conflict is not the first conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan. In 1918, it was horrible conflict, and my grandmother told me how they afraid from Armenia's pogroms in Baku. But her daughter, me, we live with Armenians very good because there are no propaganda against Armenians. But today, do you read the history school book? The Armenians is more horrible than the Nazi in this, and children in school read these books and they learn that who are enemy, first of all, Armenians. So it's necessary to support from European Union, public dialogue, public diplomacy. It's necessary to talk to Ilham Aliyev that stop this uh, propaganda against Armenia. Because you know, during all these years, the people who have relatives Armenian, so on, they live, uh, they're afraid that each day, not only police can enter, but also some other people. Because Armenians uh, on TV, on school books, as I mentioned, everywhere, it is your enemy and growing generation in these ideas. So it's necessary to demand it, stop this propaganda, created some breach between Armenia and Azerbaijan society. And last, it's necessary to understand that in reality, Ilham Aliyev himself has private and the ground negotiation with the 
leaders of Armenian Karabakh. We have information from our friends from Karabakh that when Ilham Aliyev visited Shusha, and he visited it several times, he uh, scars go to the region with the name Krasny Bazar. And it is a region which is under control of Armenia. And Ilham Ali have negotiation with the leaders that uh, I will give three, five Armenians uh, who stay in out pr prisons and I will go through this, law, through this uh, region. So he has negotiation. He do everything as he want as a dictator, but he did not think about future of our region, of our country, of our people. Unfortunately, Pashinyan is not more clever, but in Armenia, there are no political prisoners, there are no some horrible dictatorship. Mm -hmm. EU must think about how to organize a bridge between Armenians and Azerbaijan population. Thanks. I, I don't want to be impolite. Thanks a lot. There was a very strong voice as well from the civil society. And I hope you're still healthy and we can meet as soon as possible. Um, that's more than important. We got many proposals and suggestions. I think uh, a joint history uh, um, uh, historical uh, uh, commission could be also something which would be enforced by the European Union, but nevertheless, Ramazan was addressed many times. I would give Ramazan at that point first the floor and then Larissa and then to both of our EU representatives. Please, Ramazan, would you pick up some of the questions which were directly addressed to you, maybe? Yes, thank you again, Viola. I have short comments on status quo, EU assistance, and also uh, vision part from Azerbaijan. So Azerbaijan is not after uh, keeping new status quo. We want long-term peace. How you can help? Uh, this was another question. Uh, well, with weak institutions, it would be difficult for Azerbaijan and also for Armenia to go further. You may help uh, both countries uh, to strengthen uh, its institutions. Also, try to neutralize uh, destabilizing efforts from the inside of Europe. You like it or not, uh, peace has been blocked by Russia uh, and some forces, especially uh, in France, uh, try to change these rules, which can bring further losses and uh, broken uh, destinies. So you need uh, seriously to prevent this. And we are hopeful and look forward to conflict transformation and co co coexistence. The new, the, the, the new situation gives opportunities for this, and uh, we just need to, to use it. Thank you. But maybe one more word. I mean, would be Ilim Aliyev the right person uh, to guarantee this transformational process? I mean, uh, both of them, Laila and uh, Emin have, have kind of questioning this, while of course the civil society, the citizens of Azerbaijan would like to live in peace, but obviously the uh, public opinion is fueled in by, I don't know, more uh, different well, different I'll, discourse. I'm not, I'm not so sure. Maybe you could quickly comment on this as well. Thank you, Viola. I intentionally uh, didn't answer those replicas, but if you insist me to, to answer, uh, so I can give an answer from my own experience. Uh, I was part of one of the EU initiatives uh, uh, on confidence building. Uh, and I, I, I was uh, in a group with three Armenians and we were three Azerbaijanis. By the way, one of them was Zao Shriyev, uh, who is also the next speaker. I personally, during these three, three years, never had any problem with any uh, authorities from Azerbaijan not to meet Armenians or uh, going to Armenia or, or, or whatsoever. So, indeed, there are uh, rumors uh, made uh, by, by some people, even, even uh, from Azerbaijanis, uh, who has their own interests, uh, personal interests, but I'm not going uh, to, 
to go deep into this like direction but uh, Toivo Klar also knows that uh, yeah we uh, with our uh, were in a group with with uh, Armenians for more than three years we are also now talking with Armenians on the same panel and I'm sitting in Baku I'm not uh, talking to you from the Netherlands or from somewhere else and uh, uh, throwing stones to Baku I'm sitting here in Baku and I have no any problem uh, talking to Armenians and uh that's it well it's the beginning we will continue this discussion thanks a lot ramaza and larissa there were a couple of questions and maybe also you i don't know whether you have seen the question in the uh, q and a section maybe you could also quickly refer to this please go ahead um, uh, thank you, Will. I would uh, take a few minutes to reflect on what was said because I was in a position of speaking first. Um, it was uh, referred uh, to EU uh, beginnings, beheading the EU and uh, France and Germany and Second World War uh, uh, very uh, quite often. Um, and unfortunately, it was the it was the uh, coal and uh, economic cooperation that was mentioned, but somehow uh, that all was possible only after the justice, the course to access to justice, the revision and assessment of the aggression and denial, rejection of the aggression and of the war happened in right after the war and with universal uh, um, uh, human rights declaration and abiding by that. So I uh, am more than sure that no European Union would have been possible as it was um, and when it was if the justice process, access to justice uh, and the international law and standards had not been set. So that is exactly what I refer and that is exactly uh, where the you want peace, you invest in justice. And justice is very far. Before we speak of trust that is propelled by economic uh, cooperation, we have to trust uh, uh, the, 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 we have to build trust by rejecting hate, by rejecting um, uh, what was justly mentioned, our manophobia at a very highest level. Um, look, even the ombudsman, the human rights defender in Azerbaijan, welcomed aggression uh, into over the civilians. Um, the, the examples were uh, brought, I wouldn't repeat them. Um, secondly, I want to uh, stop on the first and second war. And the first war was a necessity of physical existence of these people. Uh, of the people of uh, the region. There was no, uh, no whatsoever territorial issue. That was an issue of right to life. It is later turned into territorial dispute. A very basic core human rights conflict was turned into territorial issue, territorial integrity. Let's face that. And the second conflict needs to be uh, the second war needs to be exactly, this is what I'm uh, talking, the ceasefire, not peace, was violated. The ceasefire that held for so long was violated in a way that the, war ha the world had not seen with the use of weaponry that the world had not yet employed at the scale that was employed. This needs to be assessed, folding to this might um, at a level of international law would be devastating for the international community, not only for the budding democracy in Armenia, which has been exactly uh, uh, meant to be brought to its uh, knees. So um, speaking of trust, we have to exactly um, uh, stop that uh, hate and uh, denigrating of uh, the ethnicity. Um, we have to have guarantees of the security and human rights of these people, which are not there. And no agreement that is at the moment on the table 
First of all, it doesn't hold because we see it violated and there is no recourse to set the violation back. Um, and they, there aren't these guarantees. They need to be provided by the community, by the community that is capable to secure and uh, hold accountable of the violators on any side. Uh, the military expenses uh, uh, are set to grow in Azerbaijan. What trust are we talking uh, about here? So these things, uh, these things uh, shall be addressed primarily before we speak of any tourism negotiations and uh, road openings. Uh, we literally see trade in people going on for months. Um, so uh, it's, uh, it's uh, two uh, here, three there, access to two here, two, three there. Um, disputes over something that is uh, absolutely clear, that is unacceptable to hold prisoners uh, of war and civilians after the conflict. This is something that um, I can, I don't understand how it can be disputed and the question that was asked is uh, about this. So um, I firmly believe that um, uh, it is possible, the peace shall be possible uh, and uh, that uh, the war as ugly as it was and uh, a lot of it is still continuing because there is no peace. Um, and uh, the, the, the pretense that the issue is closed, the peace is set, is absolutely false and uh, the pretext to a big, bigger tragedy. Um, so, uh, however, however, um, the only way to that is indeed employ international uh, law, employ uh, mechanisms of the international law and bring the negotiations into direct format uh, make uh, the sites talk, but under the accountable, internationally uh, justified format of the Minsk group. Today, uh, things that have been agreed and have the um, uh, status of uh, law, which are um, rejection of the aggression, international peacekeepers, status of the region, the rights of these uh, people, rights and security of these people. These are all off the table. They need to be the centerpiece of the negotiations. Negotiations should be in direct format and this is the way to start it. Um, I uh, firmly believe that we can live in peace. It is the regimes, it is, it is the, it is the political uh, need that uh, makes this all absolutely um, uh, volatile. It is the need to uh, get the control that makes this so unaccountable and volatile as it is. These are the cores of the problem and if we want to solve them, it is indeed investing in justice. Um, now this will be my um, two piece and answer, thank you. Thanks a lot, Larissa. Uh, Luke, uh, maybe you could also um, go into some of these questions. And um, I have repeatedly heard from the Azerbaijanian side that uh, because of the, let's say, failure of the 26 years of, of, of the Minsk group and you work on the OSCE relationship as well, it might be worth talking to the French that they exchange their seat uh, for a European seat. Uh, I think you or uh, Lawrence have mentioned we have a very limited role while we as a EU are absent. I mean, can't we be institutionalized in this co-chair? Um, and, and, and I mean, the bias of France, the US and Russia towards Armenia for a long time, I think that was even for me very obvious. And so before we, I mean, um, uh, cancel or, or, or switch complete to a different format, wouldn't that be a chance? And have you talked to the, to the French uh, um, government about that? Was that uh, at least um, uh, a topic? And also, I mean, there were so many questions. I don't want to go into all the details, but maybe you can pick up uh, the most important ones. And also a little bit more concrete, where would you see us um, 
in the in the driving seat a bit more than in the past because always to say we have only a limited role and we cannot do more i think this is not sufficient for the people in the region please yeah, thank you um a very good question but like uh, most good questions the answer is very complex um and we have limited time uh first of all to the question of of mr kubilius on on would the EU offer investment for peace? Uh, I think that naturally investment would flow in uh, if there were peaceful conditions and if the conditions of traveling amongst the three countries, let's not forget Georgia, were also easier. Uh, but I don't think it would be sufficient. I don't think um, we can start by that for the time being. Uh, the EU role indeed is complex. Uh, as I was saying, the OEC means group co-chair uh, was the only uh, format agreed by uh, all parties. Uh, we can, of course, have discussions on the outcome, on the results. What would be the views of EU member states? Yes, including the one that's member of the means group co-chair today. Good question, Mark. What is the role of the European Parliament also? And uh, I think Mr. Kubis is referring to the Jean Monnet dialogue for Georgia, but uh, I think it would be also very topical with, uh, with Armenia and Azerbaijan uh, parliaments. Uh, but the fundamental question is, first of all, so what do the parties want? Do the parties accept uh, that there is something to be settled? When, when I hear Azerbaijan that says that there is no more conflict, well, there's a question mark there. There's another question mark, how would Russia and Turkey react? Um, uh, I don't think it's a secret to say that Russia doesn't like the EU doing even very harmless things in the Eastern Partnership, uh, like trade agreements or whatever. So how, how would that um, play a role? It's, it's another question, but it's certainly worth reflecting it and discussing it further than, than just in two, three minutes. Uh, secondly, I would very much support what uh, both Mrs. Yunus and Mrs. Minasian have said on the need to stop hate speech, propaganda, uh, things like trophy museums, mocking the other, per the other party uh, is not conducive to peace. This is, this is very clear for me. Uh, I think it's clear to anyone. And one has, one, when one is the winner, one always has a choice, of course. And, and again, my comparison of 1918 versus 1945 is for me still very, very clear. Um, but uh, I want to finish on, a, on an optimistic note, and, and both Mrs. Yunus and Mrs. Nassian have said that peace is possible. Uh, and, and again, uh, let's look at bloody European history. Luckily so, Armenia and Azerbaijan did not suffer nearly as much destruction as what countries in Europe uh, have suffered. And I'm not only referring to France, Germany, but Poland, Greece, Yugoslavia, if you look at the, at the statistics of population affected, etc. And net, nevertheless, peace was made in Europe and long standing and uh, hopefully forever standing uh, sustainable peace. And uh, this is this is upon what we have to, to, to work and um, the EU is, is ready to play its role, but the EU can offer, cannot impose. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, uh, Lawrence. You have the last word. And uh, when I understood, or if I understood Luke correctly, he said, well, Russia is not always happy with uh, our, let's say, not just interference, but with, with our involvement. I mean, do we have to ask Russia if we want to help and if we want to mediate? I wouldn't say no, but so this is for me the general wrong approach. How is that seen, uh, being seen in the, um, in the commission and then, after you have finished, I would hand over to Heidi for the next panel. And if there are more questions, please do not hesitate then to raise them on the next panel. We have distinguished guests there as well. Please, Lawrence. Well, thank you so much. I, I'd like to build on what was just said, which is um, that there is a possibility for peace. I would put it more strongly. There, we must have a commitment towards peace. Um, I think that, um, again, for, for me, and, and this also answers the point you've just made, uh, uh, Viola, the focus must be on those populations wherever they are affected by the conflict. We, we must find the way to offer a sustainable peace framework 
and to ensure that we address all the um, difficulties that these people, real uh, practical difficulties that these people face because of this conflict, then I think um, the, the only sustainable solution is peace. And uh, that means that uh, to, to get to peace, uh, I, I don't know in any process in history that has not involved compromise by all involved. And that, um, you know, of course, it's a question of political appreciation as to what the steps are and on what exactly. But I think one cannot afford to lose sight of the goal and the, uh, and the people want and need peace for sustainable social and economic development. And without that, it will not happen, uh, as we've unfortunately had a tragic reminder in the autumn. And I, I, I do believe that the European Union, absolutely, as Mr. Kabilia says, uh, there would be a very strong peace dividend. I'm absolutely certain that um, if um, that we can engender, but a lasting and sustainable peace, uh, that is the point. Uh, and, and that way is, is where uh, the socioeconomic development of the entire region lies. And I mean, it would also be interesting, we're hearing views from the different parties, but uh, the Caucasus is broader than that. It was, a, a, I often, in discussion uh, with, with Georgians who are very concerned about the, the overall situation in the Caucasus as a whole. And I think that that's extremely important um, for a region that has been uh, growing economically until the crisis. Uh, I think it's, it's so important that uh, for, for, for confidence uh, and, and for the sustainable situation on the ground, and definitely the European Union is ready to play its part. Of course, in partnership with the European Parliament, that's why we're having this discussion today. Uh, but I, I, I would urge us all to stay focused on, on making small steps towards peace. It's not one giant leap. It's, it's having the commitment and determination to make small steps. And we all know we've been in different peace processes over the years. It's often two steps forward, one uh, step back. It's sometimes one step forward, two steps back, which is particularly frustrating. Uh, but uh, I think we have to walk that uh, long road to, to freedom and peace. Thank you. Thanks to all four of you. I wish we could be sometimes, of course we want peace, but we have to be courageous, a little bit more brave, and sometimes also be a little bit more committed, at least um, that's what my personal feeling is. Thanks Larisa, Ramazan, Lawrence, and Luke for this first panel. We immediately now ask the next speakers, please, to turn on your camera. Everyone else is, of course, very welcome uh, to stay tuned and to stay online to raise more questions. But now the floor I give over to uh, Heidi, uh, my colleague from the European Parliament, uh, to moderate the second panel. Please, Heidi. Thanks, Viola. And maybe before I move to the panel, I would just like to ask someone or some of our backup uh, persons maybe to, to put the link to the uh, Parliament's uh, draft resolution uh, if it is uh, available. I'm not sure it is, but it might be interesting for all of you. Anyway, it will be voted tomorrow, so it might change slightly. We don't know exactly the majorities, but um, it has some real substance as well. So um, indeed, uh, we can move deeper and then uh, we are again after hearing voices from, uh, from the region and uh, having um, two um, representatives of the EU executive institutions with us, uh, we can move deeper. And um, my, my, it's my pleasure to, to give now the floor to um, the designated uh, special representative, um, Toivo Klar, who knows the region in and out to, to share uh, with us um, his view on, on how to, to move uh, towards uh, uh, sustainable peace uh, from where we are now. So uh, Toivo, I will give you the floor now, please. Thank you, uh, Madam Vice President, uh, members of parliament and uh, dear colleagues. Um, so much has been said already in the, in the previous panel that uh, there's uh, not that much that I, I uh, can or, or want to add. I think it's actually uh, good to keep myself brief and there's more time for, for questions and answers. But uh, uh, I would just uh, emphasize uh, two things. 
One is um, that indeed the, the question of rhetoric and, 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 uh, um, and also <clears throat> steps uh, that can be misinterpreted uh, by the other side. Uh, this, this is really something where, where much more attention has to be paid and, and where, where every word and every, every gesture counts. And if we want to build a peaceful South Caucasus, then, then it's not just about uh, saying it once or saying it twice, but it's about doing so and, and about the being uh, seen to be doing so. And uh, this, is, this is something that we're still uh, not uh, seeing. And, and frankly, it, it works uh, both ways. Uh, I would say that there's a, um, of course, uh, from, from the Azerbaijani side, um, I, I would dearly hope to see more uh, magnanimity, more, more gestures of uh, uh, reaching out and, 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 and uh, building actively working towards a different kind of South Caucasus. Um, I would also think that, that in Yerevan, there could be more of a um, recognition of the, of the past uh, 30 years, because um, frankly, I was, I was given a book here a uh, couple of days ago, which uh, is entitled Karabakh, uh, I think it's before and after. And uh, it, the, the, it shows, um, uh, it has pictures of the, of the territory surrounding uh, Nagorno-Karabakh uh, where there's basically only destruction. Destroyed mosques, destroyed uh, graveyards, destroyed towns, and that does not reflect well on, on Armenia either. And I think there's a there's a scope to recognize that that this this is something where it's not just about uh, one side uh, behaving differently and talking differently, but it's about both sides, uh, recognizing that really a, a page has to be turned. And then of course the other the other thing is that uh, the core conflict where it all started, uh, Karabakh has not disappeared. We cannot uh, just uh, talk about uh, building a peace, uh, establishing peace between uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan as countries without the uh, question of, of uh, Karabakh, of the Armenian population of Karabakh having been uh, actively addressed and being seen to be addressed and, and there being confidence that this is, we are really turning a page also on that point. These are, uh, one, one is a question between two uh, independent countries, Armenia and Azerbaijan. Uh, the other is according to the European Union, we recognize Azerbaijan's territorial integrity, absolutely. But we still believe that this question of the Karabakh conflict has to be resolved. And there we would expect, and I would, I would personally very much expect that also from, uh, from the side of Baku, there would be uh, much more messages and positive signals coming that there is a recognition that a lot needs to be done to, uh, to resolve these and, and to, to bind these wounds that have been open for, for decades now. Uh, we have a ceasefire, we don't yet have peace, and, and there's a lot of work that needs to be done there, and the European Union certainly wants to help our two partners in the region, as well as Georgia as our third partner in the region, to, uh, to go along this road and to, and to really establish a peaceful South Caucasus. But I'll stop here and Happy to answer questions. Thank you very much, um, Toivo. 
I will come back with, with questions and comments. And um, now it's my pleasure to invite Paolo Bernamaschi to take the floor, uh, having served uh, for very many years in the European Parliament in the Green Group as a foreign policy advisor, knowing deeply the region. Paolo now uh, represents the Osservatorio Balcani Caucaso Trans Europa. So, Paolo, uh, now please, you can share your insights and recommendations with us. You are mute. Yes. Now you can hear me. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sorry. Uh, thanks a lot, Heidi, and thanks a lot, Viola, for organizing this webinar. That also, as you correctly remembered, uh, Osservatorio Balcani Caucas, which is the organization I work with now, is supporting and co hosting. And Observatorio Balkani Caucaso can be used as a platform for dialogue between all the different factions, all the different groups, and all the different communities that live in the Balkans and live in the in the South Caucasus. Now, um, going back to the specifics of this webinar, I, I when the, the Nagorno-Karabakh crisis uh, broke out in uh, at the end of September of last year. My first uh, idea, my first remembrance was when uh, Ms. von der Leyen took office and in front of the European Parliament in September 2019, she declared clearly that she wanted to lead a geopolitical commission. So she stated very clearly that there would have been a change, a, a shift as regards the course of the uh, Commission and in general of the European Union. And then the crisis broke out in the Caucasus, broke up in the Caucasus. And I, unfortunately, I realized uh, all of a sudden that that shift would have not taken place. With a lot of disappointment and frustration from my side, because of course I had strong expectations from the EU. But unfortunately, I haven't seen this shift. And what I saw, on the contrary, during the debate that took place in September, in October, in the European Parliament, I am and I, I followed closely and I listened to the speech of Mr. Borrell, the High Representative on Common Foreign and Security Policy. And that speech of Borrell, for me, was a declaration of irrelevance of the European Union, because there was a total lack of ambition as regards the role that the European Union could have played in that situation during the conflict and under the conflict. Now, I would like very much this thing to change. At that time, uh, Mr. Borrell uh, was simply hiding behind France. And that was a big mistake because you cannot uh, simply uh, delegate your position to one member country. Mambia country that had a strong voice in the area, but as you know very well, France has its own domestic agenda and it's following its domestic agenda. And that does not reflect the position of the EU as such. Now, these things should and must be changed, but I'm not sure that it will be changed at least in the near future. I think that the EU should take its responsibilities for the uh, for the for the region towards the region, because as you if you take a look at the region now, you, the U.S. asymmetrical relations with the three countries of the South Caucasus. Georgia is an associated country to the EU. Armenia just signed uh, the Comprehensive and Economic Partnership Agreement. And with Azerbaijan, we are negotiating a new agreement, a more ambitious agreement. Uh, I take stock of the fact that uh, for Georgia, the EU is the largest trading partner. The EU is the largest trading partner also for Azerbaijan. And if I'm not wrong, it's the second largest trading partner of Armenia. So there are big economic interests for the EU. And this economic interest should and should be turned also in political involvement in what's taking place over there. Now, my experience in the South Caucasus, Heidi and Viola know it very well. I mean, I've been following South Caucasus affairs for a very long time. 
I was assisting uh, an honorable member of parliament in the beginning of this century. It was, I think, 2001, 2002, Mr. Per Garton, when the very first report of the European parliament was drafted about the resumption of regional cooperation in the South Caucasus. In that report, we included some topics and some proposals that could have been picked up by the EU diplomacy, but unfortunately, they were forgotten. As of now, I see that the South Caucasus is victim of one law, that is the law of fait accompli. Now it's time to turn this page, to turn the page for the South Caucasus and pass from the law of fait accompli to the rule of law. It's very important because if you put it to the tracks of the rule of law, then things can be solved. If you leave it to the law of feta complete, there is no hope, not only for the EU, but there is no hope also for the people of the South Caucasus. So this is a challenge for the EU, is a challenge for the EU diplomacy. Now, uh, I, I um, would like really that uh, uh, the EU is not seen once again as a player, but a real play, player. I think that potential of the EU is really high, it's very strong, but we must turn this potential into concrete facts. As I said, um, I think that the EU needs, yes, in 2009, the EU correctly, and uh, I think it was a, a challenge, uh, launched the Eastern Partnership which was punctual, it was uh, important, and it's, it's, it's delivering, partly it's delivering, because there are three countries now that are associated to the EU, and things are moving forward. But at the same time, I think, as it was included in their report of uh, the beginning of, uh, of this century, uh, of the European Parliament, I think yeah, that the EU... Sorry, sorry, Paolo, just a little interruption. There's a lot of uh, sound. Does someone else have a microphone open who should not have a microphone open? Yeah. So let's see. Now it's quiet again. So please go on. I think that the EU should develop a EU strategy for the South Caucasus. And this can be done within the Eastern Partnership and devoted, dedicated specifically to the South Caucasus. Within this EU strategy, a coherent approach for the South Caucasus. I think that the, uh, the work and the mandate of the EU representative for the South Caucasus would be clear and more visible because it would be linked to that strategy. As of now, it's a little bit difficult to understand what is the role. And in terms of visibility, it seems to me that the, 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 the role of the, the EU representative for the South Caucasus, it doesn't act too much, unfortunately. Paolo, yes? please, I, we, we know that now what the sound is. It's your microphone is probably touching your clothes. So just if you move five centimeters, the problem is solved and then you can deliver your important message. Tell me better now. Is that better? Uh, yes, kind of. So let's let's see. Yeah, okay. Then I go through the proposals because in my opinion, there are some, some uh, things, some political initiative that should be taken by the EU. First of all, for, for example, I, I, as the EU was in a way uh, rather effective for the Balkans, I think that the EU should launch the, really the, 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 the initiative for a stability pact for the South Caucasus, as we did for the Balkans, for example, a sort of a conference for security and cooperation in the South Caucasus with the three different baskets. That is the security basket as for the OSCE, the security basket, the economic basket and the cultural basket for people to people contact. This should be done. But we, we I mean, the EU should show leadership for this and I'm not sure that we are willing to do that. Then, of course, the resumption of political and cultural relations at all levels must be the core of this stability pact initiative or call it whatever you want. Then I think that the, this initiative could run in parallel with what the OSCE means group is doing for Nagorno-Karabakh. 
but of course in a comprehensive way involving the whole of the South Caucasus and not just the Nagorno-Karabakh uh, conflict. And this could create the context for the Nagorno-Karabakh peace process to have more success than what it could be uh, since so, uh, until now I haven't seen that much success, that much progress. Then the EU, I think, should define and support a credible plan of confidence building measures aimed at creating the conditions for a lasting and sustainable dialogue, in particular uh, through six, seven initiatives that are partly already been undertaken, but it's important to underline again. For example, continue delivering humanitarian aid in and around Nagorno-Karabakh, but in a coherent way. Second thing, assist and ensure the safe resettlement for refugees. Partly it's doing that, but only as regards uh, internally people, um, uh, refugees from Nagorno-Karabakh in Armenia. Then uh, facilitate people to people contact. D, contribute to the protection of cultural heritage, heritage and religious sites. E, partly done already now, finance the mining projects. Currently, I think that's the most urgent problem in the area. And this facilitate the exchange of the maps concerning the landmines over there and support the ongoing campaign, landmine free South Caucasus campaign. More, I would like the EU really to spot some pilot projects at local level in areas where Aziris and Armenians live side by side really fostering interactive dialogue and paving the way for reconciliation, at least at local level. Further to this, it's important to define and set up with local community post-conflict reconstruction programs and rehabilitation projects. Last, and this is part of the, I think it's the ninth point of the ceasefire agreement of 9 November, I think that the EU should offer and start reflecting about these economic and transport corridors. That is the question of connectivity, because these things will be brought to the fore very clearly. And it's part already of this escalation that we are seeing in some parts of, of Armenia because of this infiltration, uh, presumed infiltration of Armenia of Azerbaijani forces, looking maybe uh, how to, to, to put into practice this economic and transport corridor. So in these things, it, it's important that the EU can play a role and can offer its assistance and its experience because the EU has a lot of experience in the matter. Then going on, uh, and I'll try to finish because I see that I, we are running late a bit because the, the first panel went a little bit longer than foreseen. It's important that in the new agreement that the EU is negotiating with Azerbaijan, we clearly indicate and really state that good neighborly relation and regional, and regional cooperation are a priority of the relations between the EU and Azerbaijan. We must be able to offer incentive for peace to Armenia, especially also during the electoral campaign, because of course, all the political forces in Armenia will be focused on what's going on in Nagorno-Karabakh. So this is part of the campaign. We can have a say, we look for peace. And, the, uh, and of course, the relations between the EU and Armenia can deepen if Armenia is committed to peace. As for the European Parliament, as I said before, uh, the, the, the group proposed, the Green Group in particular, proposed many things in the past, but I think that this thing should be picked up again. So Mr. Kubilius was referring about a possible human dialogue between members of parli the parliaments between Ar of Armenia and Azerbaijan. So why not try, why not trying to do that within uh, the Euronest Assembly? There is a possibility someone is to propose it. Maybe you, Haiti, maybe Viola can propose that. And to have a working group within the Euronest Assembly involving also Georgians in order to have some sort of parliamentary uh, dialogue at South Caucasus level. That's a possibility and that can be done without too many efforts because it's already there. And uh, in view of the, in view of the, start, real start of a 
um, of the, uh, to give a boost to the peace process in Nagorno-Karabakh in order to deal with the final status of Nagorno-Karabakh, it wouldn't be bad if the EU could, could really launch the possibility of having uh, twinning programs uh, with a situation that were tense in the past and now they are not any more tense because they were able to achieve some sort of reconciliation uh, and solve some of the other controversies. Like for example, what happened, I'm thinking of uh, the state of, of, of South Tyrol in Italy, which is the country where I come from, for example. But Haiti thinking of the Holland Islands, for example, mm -hmm. that's a good example. And these are some, some sort of a twinning projects mm -hmm. that could be brought forward, proposed and brought forward by the EU. Finally, I think that I don't know whether this is included in the resolution uh, that will be adopted by the European Parliament tomorrow. So I'm asking maybe Viola and Heidi if you can answer to this because I haven't read the resolution. But it would be important in order to, to, to look for international justice that the EU really could urge the parties and promote the setting up of an international investigation on the use of prohibited weapons and on the breach of international law and of international humanitarian law concerning the recent, recent crisis. Now, concluding, the potential for me of the EU for the Nagorno-Karabakh and in general for the South Caucasus is there. Of course, it's up to the European Union to turn is this potential into concrete de deeds. We must materialize this in order to be credible. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Paolo, for a very interesting um, uh, plan, uh, which could indeed uh, be discussed further. Um, to answer your question about the resolution, which uh, Viola has been negotiating with the other groups, I can see point seven, uh, there's a very strong uh, reference uh, calling on the Armenian and Azerbaijani authorities to conduct independent, prompt, public and effective investigations and prosecute all credible allegations of grave breaches of the Geneva Conventions and other violations of international law and war crimes. And there's also a reference uh, to the need uh, of um, the cooperation with the European Court of Human Rights uh, on this question of Armenian prisoners. So uh, thank you and uh, we will move on and it's my pleasure now to, to introduce uh, to you Olesia Vartanian, who is the crisis group's uh, senior Allen analyst for the South Caucasus. Uh, so um, uh, I understand that you are perhaps speaking from Tbilisi, is that correct Olesia? That's true. Yes, where you research and produce reports on regional security issues in Armenia, Georgia and Azerbaijan. And uh, you have a special focus on breakaway regions uh, in the South Caucasus, Abkhazia, Nagorno-Karabakh, and South Ossetia. So we're very interested in what, what, how you see the situation. So Olesia, please. Well, I have to start with uh, just by thanking you and Viola uh, that you do not give up and you continue <laughs> uh, organizing events like this, um, especially in the public space, that you continue um, um, just show us your interest uh, in the topic altogether um, and especially bringing in uh, some distinguished guests uh, from different EU institutions. I think it's really very important and we all have been witnessing uh, in these recent months how much the EU, uh, how many attacks uh, the EU has been receiving and uh, um, I really hope that that will not discourage um, people like you, you know, from uh, engaging with the topic altogether. And uh, the resolution that you mentioned, I haven't read the, re the text itself, I just saw a short uh, contents on that, but uh, this is really very important. And um, I, I think this is uh, just uh, for, for the whole region and for a number of issues uh, that were mentioned uh, by the previous uh, speakers and particularly the prisoners of war, for sure. Um, well, you know, I work for the International Crisis Group and I have a privilege of uh, discussing things with my different colleagues uh, who are based in different capitals, including my colleague Zaur, who is, uh, uh, who is with me uh, at this panel, um, and also colleagues in Moscow and uh, in Brussels, in Istanbul. And uh, we, we mainly at Crisis Group, what we do is we are doing research and we are trying to stay realistic, you know, in, in what we are seeing and what we are suggesting. And uh, I should say that Nagorno-Karabakh has been particularly difficult in that sense. Um, 
uh, I was in uh, Armenia just a month ago and I spent um, uh, quite some time, you know, doing uh, uh, field research and talking to different people um, in addition to my travels during the war itself. Um, and, you know, although six months have passed uh, since the ceasefire, uh, it really feels like uh, the war just uh, finished last month, you know, and with this particularly because of what Larissa Minasian was uh, saying and also what uh, Leila Yunus uh, was mentioning uh, with this, uh, uh, with our withstanding post-war issues, immediate, I would say, post-war issues related to the prisoners of war detainees and also the displaced people and the humanitarian, I would call it crisis, uh, the displaced people from Nagorno-Karabakh and also inside the conflict zone itself. But in addition to that, it's of course, with terrible environment uh, that we have been observing in recent months. And I'm, I'm afraid that we are going to witness it more and more. Um, but I would say that the problem is probably even bigger. Um, no one here in the region can really understand where we are heading and how, how to proceed altogether. Whether we are to start off in a slow but necessary way towards peace, or we are to wait for the next war. This is the question that I, I have been hearing from the people uh, who are directly affected by the war. Whether we're, when are we going to have the next war? It's not a question of if we are going to have the war, it's when. And this is really very unfortunate. And uh, especially you can feel it when, when you uh, start um, getting into the situation on the ground. And when you are on the ground, it feels like the next war will be, uh, will be happening in an observable future. The, the sides are definitely not about the peace altogether. What they are doing, what they have been doing in the recent six months, they were building new military positions and military trenches. It's not like they are actually thinking about something big. They are preparing for, for, for hopefully uh, a new status quo, but maybe even for, for, for the standoff, uh, you know, something that we will be observing. And with new um, situation, with post-war situation, I would say that it is more explosive than what was before the 2020 war, because um, that region has been seeing trenches for decades. Right now, the trenches, they are very close to each other and they are right next to the civilian areas. So even some low level tensions that are to take place on the ground, they're going to affect many more people and displace people again. And I think this is something that we really need to pay attention to. Um, while the Russian peacekeepers, they're based in the region and they have a certain authority, and I would say that they have quite a lot of authority. Um, they are not able to do everything. Right now, they are based along the main roads and uh, they are not at the line, <laughs> you know, the, at, at the new front line. And uh, what's happening is that they, they seem to be the only first, the, the only actors who are able, for example, to fix water supply systems, who are able to go and help people to do farming, uh, who are even chasing cattle sometimes, you know, ch chasing cows. <laughs> um, and when you look at this, uh, the, the main question is there, why uh, can't there be there any kind of like a, normal mechanism that we have, for example, in the context of Transnistria, of Ukraine, or Georgia, when the actors who are responsible for the situation on the ground, they come together on a regular basis and they speak and discuss the topics and they communicate and that actually provides much more transparency and clarity and predictability about the situation on the ground. This is not something that the Russian peacekeepers uh, are doing right now. And I'm afraid that if we do not really introduce anything like this, you know, then uh, there will be a more potential for some more incidents and some more problems uh, on the ground. Um, well, the Russian peacekeepers, they are there. And uh, of course, I mean, <laughs> you know, there, there can be different views on that, but for the moment they are, um, they are the force that allowed not just the stabilization after the war, after this brutal war. They were also the ones who allowed the return of many ethnic Armenians. The majority of them, they were able to return. But of course, the Russian peacekeepers, they are not able to provide, for example, the housing or, or to those displaced uh, ethnic Armenians uh, from the territory that are now controlled by Azerbaijan. And uh, Nagorno-Karabakh is effectively left on its 
on its own, you know, with, uh, with the problems. And I believe Lawrence Meredith that raised the issue of the access. I think it's really very important. And in that sense, I would not see much of the, um, much of the conflict with the Russian side because the Russian side does not have uh, the capacity and also the finances that uh, the Western organizations, uh, the, the Western governance and international organization can have in handling the humanitarian crisis on the ground inside Nagorno-Karabakh. We have been seeing that the issue has been mainly lost in the political debate between uh, Baku and Yerevan. And uh, this is so important, in fact, you know, to find the ways to, um, to, do, to do something with that. You know, I understand that uh, the European Union is more about like offering but not imposing things. But uh, the European Union is also a very important trade partner to Azerbaijan. And maybe that can also uh, play a role um, in, in terms of like finding the ways how to relieve uh, Baku's, some of the Baku's um, you know, concerns related to the presence of the international organizations on the ground inside Nagorno-Karabakh. Um, why it's important, it's not just an immediate thing, in my view. Uh, the effects of that, they will be longer term. And uh, if we are really discussing again the peace, the prospects for peace, then it's uh, kind of, you know, sitting in our capitals and watching and saying that we don't like the fact that the Russians and Turks, they made a deal, you know, and we now have the Russian peacekeepers that really, really kind of does not work well for people like me who continue living in this region and who are thinking about the future of this region, you know, because uh, we, we all understand that right now all the acts are in one basket in a way, you know, Russia basically um, is responsible not just for the um, situation on the ground in terms of uh, its presence at the peacekeeping uh, mission and also at with Russian Turkish Obser observation center. Russia is the one who is uh, doing like a crisis management between Armenia and Azerbaijan, for example, the last week's um, uh, events uh, that are still continuing at the state border. And, and Russia is also the one who is mediating with uh, conversations about economy. Um, it's just, uh, you know, when, when my colleagues are discussing and when I am discussing the uh, with issue with the Russian actors, I, I can understand that there is a space there and they definitely would want to share the responsibility. They would want to stay in lead with us for sure, but that does not mean that they would kind of, you know, push uh, away anyone who is to come and to contribute. And I understand that it's really very sensitive and <laughs> look, I mean, um, we, we live in the real world. But at the same time, I mean, uh, what are we left with? Um, should we just kind of, you know, close the region and call it Russian backyard officially now? Or we actually should think about the ways how to um, build links, sustain contacts and uh, sustain programs uh, so that uh, we keep a possibility, uh, not just uh, to help the region to develop, but also to sustain its contacts uh, with um, the Western world, in my view. Um, and, and for this to happen again, I mean, maybe we should still um, think small, you know, and uh, in my view, with very uh, immediate post-war issues related to the prisoners of war, um, some of the issues that Larissa raised, they are really very important. The issues of the stabilization on the ground and, and uh, support to the normalization of the life in the conflict zone, they're essential. Thank you very much, Olesia, for all these proposals and, and, and your vision on how indeed um, this um, whole situation could be turned into uh, the road to peace instead of uh, to the next war, as you, you described. Um, now I would like to invite our fourth speaker, and then I still hope that we will have a, at least a quarter of an hour for exchange. So uh, it's my unpleasant uh, duty to, to remind uh, everyone about uh, this late um, passing of time. And um, anyway, uh, we will continue uh, with Zaur Shiriev, uh, who is the crisis group's uh, analyst for the South Caucasus. And um, uh, in my understanding is that Zaur, you speak from Baku. Uh, so indeed, um, 
SAUS uh, specialist um, skills are on reporting on security and foreign policy issues, including the what we call the protracted conflicts in the South Caucasus. Uh, and Saur is very much focused on the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, as well as Azerbaijan's relations with the regional actors, including Turkey, Russia, and Iran. So I, I'll invite uh, Saur to take the floor. Do we have a technical problem? I think, uh, Zaur, do you hear, hear me? Can you speak? Your, your picture is frozen, but maybe you can still try to yes, speak. Yes, I can hear you. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. I... I'm, I'm afraid we have a connection problem. So let's let's try so, again. Mm -hmm. It could uh, could it be helpful? Uh, uh, okay, maybe we should switch our cameras off for the time being. That sometimes helps. Sorry, you can try again. Yes, uh, the, thank you for the invitation and thank you for this inter interesting discussion about the EU South East and peace between Azerbaijan and, uh, uh, Azerbaijanis and Armenians. Uh, so I would like to focus on the, the subject of can do or what's ex expectation from you. At the same time, I would like to share first about a perception about how you see the post war situation uh, in the region. Uh, uh, the, at least this, this, this is this is what we observed uh, in the region that there is a perception among the, some EU members or EU officials that uh, first of all seeing this region as a or the seeing this uh, agreement as a Russian led agreement and uh, not seeing the EU's uh, the political role in this uh, implementation of this agreement and that's why uh, uh, feeling that there is no place for EU playing uh, a greater role for lasting peace between Azerbaijan and Armenia. So this is the one perception. And the second perception is that uh, the, that the, the, the region, regional countries uh, the, uh, expecting from EU only uh, material support, financial support for rebuilding or uh, reconnection between Azerbaijan and Armenia or a return of IDPs and the housing and other things. And, and, and there is a notion that the EU is not a, EU would like to play, uh, to become a player, not a payer. So this is another second perception. And uh, the third perception is that the conditionality perception is that, uh, that everything can happen if, if Azerbaijanis or Armenians can do these, these, these things, a list of these things, and then EU can contribute or support uh, for Azerbaijan and Armenia's uh, engagement. So, and uh, we can continue, we can add more perception that emerge uh, somehow in, in Europe or EU member states. So, but in reality, the, everyone knows that uh, this, the, in November, the Moscow broke a deal, uh, ended the fighting, but not the broad uh, true peace. Uh, but the lasting peace uh, does not require everyone uh, to agree on everything from the start. And also it will be very premature to push the parties towards the lasting peace as soon as after the war, despite uh, the six months has passed uh, the, since, the, uh, since the end of the war. So uh, a few things that I, will, I would like to indicate that how you can help uh, the boss army and other ways. And first of all, uh, first issue is about uh, the supporting this economic connection. Uh, the between Azerbaijan uh, and Armenia. Uh, and sometimes uh, uh, people gave uh, examples from EU, EU's own past history about reconciliation and friendship between the uh, enemy nations. But I think uh, when, when, when people look to the Azerbaijan and Armenia, uh, they also um, forgot about one, one important element is that uh, these two countries never uh, have a uh, uh, never lived together 
or never became a neighbor in the last, uh, never, never was uh, the neighbor in the last uh, 30 years, unlike uh, after what happened after the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union. So that's why in the early 19s, there was a different perception between Azerbaijanis and Armenians. They had an experience of living together despite all horrific memories of the war. So, but in the last 30 years, this all of the memories actually erased from the memories of Azerbaijanis and Ar Ar Armenia. So that's why uh, why this economic reconnection and reconciliation is important in the first days, before, and this can uh, this can uh, this can create a, a, a some environment for them to to engage and to talk to, to each other. So that's why this uh, uh, railroads and uh, other uh, uh, transport corridors projects. Uh, the EU can also help to expertise uh, to help them the, how to to do the things better. Not only the uh, not we are not talking about the financial. So this is the one thing that you can play play a role. The second is that I think the EU uh, they, they, there is a need a, a, a dialogue between Azerbaijan and Armenia, and uh, Minsk Group is uh, is undermined and there is a less. Uh, trust to Minsk group format, at least uh, from a Azerbaijani perspective, but at least the dialogue uh, between the uh, state representative of Azerbaijan and Armenia is essential. Before uh, is the partnership uh, 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 might be a, a place for reconnection between Azerbaijan and Armenia, but we know that the Eastern partnership is not a, uh, the same Eastern partnership that it was uh, 10 years ago. So that's why it might be there should be a much more uh, the new elements uh, to uh, to, uh, to add uh, this format and uh, and to find a way to support this uh, initial discussion or the more more important discussion between Azerbaijan and Armenia. Armenia. So this is the second thing, and the third thing uh, is that uh, we always see the EU this, uh, even in the last ten years, EU has a much more contribution to the peace building project in the region between Azerbaijanis and Armenians. And there were different perceptions in Armenia and Azerbaijan about this peace building, uh, peace building initiatives because there, there, there was and there still is a different understanding of the peace between Azerbaijanis and Armenians. Uh, how they see that, what does it mean the, uh, living in a peaceful uh, environment? What does it, uh, the final peace means for these two, 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 two countries? But uh, the, what, was the, what was the difference of this, uh, the, pre-war or the peace building initiative, it was less visible. Uh, it was uh, focused on the, the small group, groups of the people and the entities. So, but, uh, and uh, the new peace, peace building initiatives might need a much more the national level of dialogue. So not a, uh, only between the, the small group of people talking to each other. Uh, we observed that how this the peace builders uh, in the last uh, 20 years uh, or 30 years peace builders became uh, a part of uh, different cultural discussion in, in both countries, especially uh, so their contribution was uh, less visible. Uh, so the more more visible and more uh, strat strategic uh, peace building, nation dialogue is the, 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 the third things I would like to add. And the third is that uh, EU can help to mitigate the war effects. So this is the humanitarian assistance uh, EU over the help the UN agencies and International Committee of the Red Cross and, and, and enable them to, to deliver urgent assistance to the world uh, displaced as a result of Armenians. But in the long term, I think the EU needs a much more uh, uh, different uh, strategy, especially taking account that uh, 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 there, there is a need of the return of the dis displaced people. So uh, in case of Azerbaijan, I think Azerbaijan is, is uh, building uh, or preparing the massive plan of the return of, of displaced people, and they will be much more out of questions. So before international organizations play the role of preparing uh, this massive plan of uh, uh, displaced people uh, return, and uh, so uh, might be uh, the EU can contribute to uh, pre preparation and monitoring of the, the return process and uh, the sharing its expertise with this, uh, the stakeholders uh, in the region and also uh, helping them to immediate reconciliation of the process. Uh, and also, uh, 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 so the last thing is that uh, the different, uh, the, probably the EU needs, uh, the, there's a mi many disagreements between the Brussels and other EU capitals on, on one hand and Moscow and Ankara on the other hand. 
So, but improving prospect for the peace uh, in the South Caucasus is one area, broadly speaking, they have a good reasons uh, to work to, uh, to, uh, together. So the, the strategy shouldn't be to ignore one, the Moscow or Ankara, and to push only one player across to, to the region. So only collaborative efforts can uh, help the, the size to engage an EU to improve its assistance and uh, role in the region in the post-war period. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you very much for your, your, your contribution. I also hear that you are saying that a broader uh, frame than the Eastern Partnership might be needed for, for any EU initiative. And there's maybe something about what you said that um, e the Eastern Partnership is not what it used to be 10 years ago. We can discuss that. But OK, so um, because I have been told that the, the screening uh, will be, um, the, the, in fact, I think the Zoom will, will finish at, at uh, 20 past four Brussels time. And I'm, I'm happy this is not the case. But um, then I would suggest that, um, that we give um, the possibility for the two persons who have raised their hands, if that is the case, Emin Husseinov and Leila Yunus. But this is one minute each, and I have to interrupt you because we would like to hear then answers, and then I still uh, am very eager to hear from my co-chair, uh, Viola, some uh, remarks at the end. So, um, Emin, um, will you start? And just one minute, please. Is this a raised hand or not? Uh, yes. Okay, I, one minute. Uh, thank you again for all speakers in the second panel on space shield. Thanks for both of you. Unfortunately, we would like to see for the future for not only green party political groups from European Parliament organize events like this, but we would like to see leadership also from other political groups like EPP, socialists and others. But thanks again, Mike. My questions uh, to EU officials, and uh, again, I would like to know for when it's possible to organize real dialogue between Azerbaijan and Armenian civil society mm -hmm. with involvement for EU officials with the EU European Parliament, because what we see uh, since from after war, we didn't see like such a serious contact on bilateral level. And and again, my I might absolutely agree with different stakeholders and especially uh, from my, our colleagues from uh, Balkan and Caucasus Observatory for yes, you have to use momentum and leadership to provide more support for civic initiatives in the region. And don't wait like uh, issues when we find agreement between government, because we, when we spoke about investment, we call for investment for civil society and for people's dialogue. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, That's Amin, for, for the remark and question. Uh, Leila, do you have a question or comment briefly? Yeah. Leila, the floor is yours for one minute. You are mute. It's okay? Yes. Yes, it's okay. Yeah, so Thank please. You. I have suggestion and question to Paolo. So first of all, I think that everybody understands it. It's very important to escape the new war. Of course, it cannot be next three years, but it can be in future. And it's necessary to do important things to escape new war. And first of all, it's necessary to create public, to change public opinion in Azerbaijan and Armenian society. For Azerbaijan, Armenians is more than enemy. 
for Azerbaijan nation, the word Armenia is something as bastard. And in Armenia, the same situation. It necessary create a dialogue, create a breach between these two society. And what EU did in Balkans, it necessary to do on South Caucasus. Public dialogue, uh, public diplomacy, Armenian civil activists can visit Baku uh, to organize these meetings, Ar Azerbaijan to Armenia spoke, and it's necessary that on TV will be stopped this horrible propaganda as enemy, enemy, and pre preparing maybe, I do not know, independent TV, where Armenians and Azerbaijan can spoke as a dialogue, because for, for population for young generation they can listen that oh armenians and Azerbaijan's young girls boys they can speak as a friends it's important to change public opinion thanks yeah thank thanks a lot leila uh, i must say that i was uh, absolutely uh, horrified when i saw that uh, school children were taken to this trophy park in in baku some weeks ago to the opening ceremony i cannot imagine anything like that. But um, yes, indeed, public opinion and, and avoiding hate speech and uh, trying to, to also listen to the other side. Uh, now, um, yes, we have, uh, luckily, we have a quarter of an hour. So um, um, I would ask uh, if uh, some of our panelists, they have also received some questions. So, so please uh, take the floor. Maybe, Paolo, you start because there was a direct question to you. Well, it's, it's, it's nice to hear from Leila. After a long time, I, I couldn't talk to her. So it's nice to have occasions like this. So at least we can get back to the old habits. Having said that, I mean, I spoke a lot before, so I don't need to add anything more. I share more or less the position of, uh, of Leila and, and what she said. The only thing I recommend, in a way or the other, since we have a sustained dialogue, I mean, the EU has a sustained dialogue with both EU, uh, with both Azeri diplomacy and Armenian diplomacy, the call to tone down statement is always there, and it's important really that uh, that the EU can prioritize these issues in this dialogue. And for the rest, I think I'm, I mean we 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 all agree. I mean, Heidi, you pointed out uh, what happened recently in Azerbaijan. I can remind I can remember very well when I visited Nagorno Karabakh some time ago. I can tell you that I I, I heard. Oh, I, all kind of nasty things about the Azeris from uh, Nagorno-Karabakh politicians at that mm. time. So unfortunately, these things happen any day. And we had so many occasions where we dealt with issues. So these things must stop. And all the restrictions must be dropped concerning contacts between Armenian and Azerbaijanis at civil society level. Please, let's have an appeal in this direction and call for a resumption of dialogue at civil society uh, level immediately. Thanks, thanks a lot, Paolo. Um, Toivo, you raised your hand. Thank you. Thank you. I, I want to um, make one point, which is that um, it's very important for us to engage. Uh, and we're talking, um, uh, and I think we all agree that the EU has to have a uh, bigger role. I think we have a scope for having a bigger role. Uh, the Eastern Partnership has been mentioned. I think as, as, a, as a partner of all three South Caucasus countries, we can work on, on trilateral cooperation. We can support trilateral cooperation between the three countries. But I think what is very important is that we actually uh, have a bigger footprint on the ground. That means the one thing that has been said, of course, economically, I think, of course, economic footprint will also follow the um, uh, developments on, on, on the peace front, but, but uh, something that uh, uh, Mr. Kubilius mentioned, um, uh, working on, on, on bringing parliaments together, I think that that might be an interesting Avenue to pursue. I think the 
the uh, question of, of uh, European Parliament uh, perhaps also sending, sending a mission to uh, both uh, Baku and Yerevan to demonstrate that not only are we making uh, statements uh, here in, in Brussels, but we actually want to engage, we want to discuss. I think it's a question of also showing, um, as, 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 we, as we well know, that in, in the, particular in the, in the Caucasus region, I think the, the, the sign of respect and wanting to demonstrate that we are willing to hear and, and talk with, with uh, all sides, I think that is very important. And, and so I am also of the opinion that, that we need more engagement at the political level to demonstrate uh, that not only is the EU uh, interested uh, in terms of, of, of making statements, but, but we are genuinely willing to put uh, both energy and resources behind uh, supporting uh, peaceful developments in the, in the, in the region. Toivo, could I ask you, what do you think about this idea that um, Paolo raised about a need for the EU to, to um, put together a strategy for South Caucasus with a stability pact? Do you think it's something that could be discussed? Well, I think, I think it is uh, an interesting idea. I think it, it uh, depends on, on our, uh, you know, the stability pact was... Uh, had many facets, one of which was also uh, the prospect of membership. Um, so, of course, uh, we have to we have to keep in mind that the diff that there are differences in, in political, uh, you know, our, our political relationship and political prospects, and, and also uh, political ambitions of the countries in the region. But but having a strategy uh, and and uh, is I don't think a, a bad idea. Um, I, I think also as far as if we're talking about Georgia, I think our, our strategy for Georgia is a bit uh, outdated and, and deserves to be, uh, for the conflicts in Georgia, deserve, deserves to be revisited. So, so, uh, so this would, uh, I don't, I, I think that is certainly an interesting avenue to pursue. Thank you. Um, I'll take one more question because uh, otherwise, um, and uh, this will be uh, maybe a bit uh, too much one way. So we have Wilfried Hilge somewhere who wants to, to ask a question. And please be very brief because I still want to make sure that Zaura and Olesia can take the floor once and then we need a bit time for the conclusion. So Wilfried, are you there? I don't think I hear. Wilfried Yilge. So I would then um, move to, oh, let me see. Yes, Wilfried, you're, you're, the floor is yours for one minute. Can you open your microphone? Yes. Hello, hello. Yes, we hear you. Yes, okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my, my points have been taken. Thank you very much for the event. Yep. Yeah. Okay. okay, okay, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Bye -bye. Yeah, so um, Zaur, uh, what, what are your thoughts about what you have heard and uh, the, the, the points that uh, Emin and, uh, and Leila made and whatever you want to add? Uh, yeah, I think it's important to have a more role of the, the, the civil society dialogue and also this, the civic engagement also that sounds a good idea and it will be much more and, uh, necessary for for future, and we should also keep in mind that uh, the after absence of the thirty years, at least the Soviet in Armenia so is going to be a neighbor in this uh, in the new station. Of the, might be a few years later, so that would be. So they need a, uh, that talk, and they need a, to find a way how to engage and uh, uh, the more uh, might be not a radical way, but more strategic and, uh, way. So that's why, in that sense. But the EU's role and also civic engagement and initiative will be much more needed. Okay, thank you. And then Olesia, you have the last word before Viola. Uh, I will be brief. I just uh, wanted to say that, uh, you know, with 30 years of separation between Armenian society and Azerbaijani society, it played a, bit, a terrible role, really. I mean, people of my generation, and I'm 35, we nearly don't speak uh, to to you know, to the people uh, who are on different sides. And uh, um, 
this creates a certain problem. I'm sometimes jealous when I listen to uh, people like Leila Yunus, you know, who can uh, bridge, you know, certain personal, I, I mean, attitudes, you know, and look uh, from the perspective of the other side and uh, because they have an experience of living next to each other. And I think it's really very important to pay attention to this very fact when we are calling for the dialogue that people uh, living uh, in Azerbaijan and in Armenia, in many cases, they may even use the same language. We can speak English and they may look uh, and describe the same object, but it will happen in such a way that you will never ever think that they are describing the same. And it will really, it's a real effort and it will take time. And for that, it's not only in, in, <laughs> enough, you know, to meet uh, and to express ourselves, there is a need to hear what, what the other side is saying, you know, what kind of grievances are on the other sides. And unfortunately, you know, uh, like Toyba said, the, with uh, luggage that we have for 30 years of, uh, of the conflict, it's huge. And to any, for example, question and concern raised by Armenians, uh, Azerbaijan is bringing like a, I don't know, a huge list of their concerns and grievances. But uh, in my personal view, um, you know, th there will be a need uh, for some, uh, some, some conversation. Um, and uh, I would probably just uh, finish on my, on a personal note, you know, when the war uh, started, look, I mean, I've been working on the, on, on the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict for five years, and I wrote a report uh, in 2017 that, that describes, uh, that described the war. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. it all happened <laughs> the way, yeah. Uh, you know, so for me, uh, it's yes. rather a question whether in my lifetime I'm going to see any sign of possible cohabitation or whether it's going to be an endless conflict with uh, small or, la or big wars, you know, from time to time. Thanks very much, Olesi, also for this uh, personal note. And now, uh, Viola, uh, please take the floor. To conclude, I, I'm not mute. No, I thought that uh, Zaur uh, would like to. Oh, okay, great. Thank you so much to to everyone who have uh, who has and who have spoken um, during the first and the second panel, as well as our very active audience who contributed with a lot of comments, questions, and also proposals for us as parliamentarians, but also for the EU as such as a becoming a more active um, a mediator and maybe also as uh, uh, Paolo likes to say, not just a payer, but also a player. Um, I'm very much in favor of this uh, saying what I see that uh, Olesa uh, even um, empowered us uh, that the Russian would be happy if they could share responsibility. That was actually for the first time that I've heard that. I mean, they would like to, uh, to stay in the lead, but nevertheless uh, share responsibility. This should be something which uh, we should at least try and maybe test uh, and maybe ask for and demand for because uh, even if, if, if some of our speakers have mentioned that uh, the credibility of the European Union is currently very small, um, I would say, nevertheless, um, many people have and expressed the wish uh, that the EU is becoming more involved as a civil actor, as a peace uh, mediator, and also from our side, from the European Parliament side, we have a very strong friendship group. Uh, who, who covers um, the entire region, of course, of the South Caucasus, as has uh, Teuber said. Uh, we are very happy that we now finally solved uh, the political stalemate and, in Georgia. And so we can also <coughs> account of <coughs> the Georgian colleagues um, to <coughs> mediate a little bit more. Uh, I think that Andreas Kubius in that respect is right. We should look for a broader peace uh, uh, making process and he called it the Schumann process maybe like this uh, that's that's also a good idea we can pick up um, um, I know that the upcoming reports on Armenia and Azerbaijan will give us another opportunity to talk about the situation in the region and uh, Paolo has 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 drawn um, uh, um, attention on a man uh, a lot of different 
uh, new initiatives, <clears throat> which we would pick up uh, and maybe organize as separate first digital event uh, with uh, uh, also a broader representatives uh, from uh, different institutions, also from member states maybe, and hopefully we can then come to the region, talk to people on the ground, have more opportunities, more time, and, and uh, uh, really, I mean, what you have said, Alessa, is absolutely right, and so, I mean, you are in a generation where you never expected or when you never thought there is a, a different situation than this, this conflict or now there was a hot war. And I really hope we could uh, at least have a perspective where you both have a solid and sustainable peace ahead of you and not just peace, but also a perspective where people like to stay in the region where they see they can live from their income, um, they, they do not have to suffer, they are not humiliated by the neighbors, they are not threatened by the neighbors, but also they accept that there is in the end any kind of a compromise. Um, and, and what many people have uh, repeatedly said is inflammatory uh, rhetorics um, during the last weeks were not helpful. I don't want to uh, name one of the countries because I know uh, that is always difficult but in that respect, um, I, I understand um, somebody said that the winner has more responsibility. And if you call Azerbaijan in, uh, at that point a winner, I would see a broader, let's say, share of responsibility uh, on the Azerbaijanian side. And I hope they are aware of this. Uh, we would like to continue this debate and this dialogue. I'm very grateful to Heidi that the, she took the first initiative um, to uh, bring up uh, this uh, topic. And thanks to Paolo with his um, um, Observatory uh, NGO. There was a very good cooperation. Uh, I like to continue and I see, as I said before, we have much. We have many more friends in the European Parliament who would contribute. Uh, we will include them next time. We can organize something bigger for sure. That was a good start. Thank you. Thank you all uh, for taking part and participating so actively. Stay healthy and hopefully to see you soon in person. Then, good afternoon and bye bye. <laughs>